Welcome to the Star of Grind. Hi, everybody. I'm Andy. Uh, I've got some slides. Who am I, though? Uh, so obviously, uh, I was very fortunate enough in the early days to uh, have a lot to do with putting together the first iPhone. Uh, before that, I had written something called Dashboard. If you guys are Mac guys, maybe you, you've seen it before. A little uh, first idea that we could use uh, web pages for applications <coughs> instead of uh, native applications. Um, so we built the iPhone. Uh, as soon as we launched that, I, I, uh, I left. Uh, I left Apple uh, to join Palm, and we decided to make something called WebOS. Uh, it wasn't as uh, much of a success as, uh, as iPhone was, but I think technologically it was kind of an interesting uh, direction to take. Uh, since then, we got acquired by HP. Uh, I left uh, as soon as the shackles came off uh, and started a company. So I'm an entrepreneur now, just like a lot of you. So I'm going through a lot of the same, uh, a lot of the same questions and problems uh, that you guys have. Uh, so when we first started, somebody asked me to give a talk, Perry, give a talk on, you know, what's the future of mobile? Uh, I actually have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I could stand here and tell you that the iPhone 8's got a, a new sphincter valve or, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's, aside from being just kind of a general interest, uh, you know, novelty, uh, is people who are trying to start companies, what I think we really want to find out is what's the future of mobile in a way that we can take advantage of that and have it give us an edge in some way. Uh, and so that's really the question uh, that I was going to try to answer uh, for today. So I'm going to start that with a couple of questions. First is, where do you develop? We have some stupid number of billions. This actually came from from a pitch deck that I did. So this is why the numbers are nice and VC friendly. You know, billions of, billions of smartphones, 300 million tablets, and we have other devices coming. Obviously wearables are gonna be huge, Google Glasses, and, and all sorts of cool things like that. Out of all those devices, how do you figure out where you're going to deploy, you know, your product? And I'm gonna, you know, say something kind of controversial, and I think, I think the device is dead, and, that stems from you know, some, some big thinking that we did. Having now made a couple of these platforms, it doesn't make any sense as a guy with you know, a, a company of three people to make a whole huge investment in one platform on one particular device or even a family device. You make something for the iPad or the iPhone or who cares, whatever, Android. It doesn't make any sense. I think what actually makes a lot more sense is to build something that can address a whole family of needs. Now, the numbers that we have available to us, when we decide to figure out where we're gonna go, do you pick the smaller, now, sadly, uh, iOS market, less people, but they make a lot more money uh, for the app store and for the developers? Or do you pick the larger Android app store numbers? We got lots of people now. You can't uh, look sideways without finding somebody with an Android device now. So if you have your choice between that, what do you pick? I had no idea. I'd say both. Uh, you know, you could also uh, look at Tizen. Oh, no, don't do that. Tizen's dead. Uh, but okay, iOS and Android, I think, are the two big competitors. Uh, you know, Windows Mobile has got an interesting platform, but when you look at how do you create the most opportunity for your company, it's not any one of those. They're all commodities to some degree. You have phones in either one market. You can pick and create an iPhone app, an Android app, or who gives a crap app, uh, but then you've only addressed that one particular need. Is that the right strategy? I don't think it is. You know, these big companies now, you know, when I was back at Apple or HP, HP, you know, that's you and 330,000 of your closest friends. There's lots of people at HP, and all they do is generate numbers and work, and there's some HR people there too, but, but what's the point of all that? These guys, create and they give themselves this huge edge that as startup people, we don't have. They got people generating all sorts of demographic data, and ethnographic data, and pornographic data, whatever they got. But they have all that data, but they don't actually take advantage of it. One of the pieces of, of uh, uh, advantages, one of the big advantages that we have is that we can actually kind of shoot from the hip a little bit. But we still have to make the right decision. <clears throat> Look at the development environment. These aren't free. 
these are nice chairs. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I, this is like to me giving a talk whenever I do these things, either a Palm or HP. It's like you see a new stage and you're like, oh, it's like going into a hotel room. You want to try everything out. They have all these waters here that nobody ever uses. Uh, but it's just kind of tempting. These are very comfortable. Uh, the development environment, you've got your choice of you know, iOS and Android, but then when you pick one, then you have to figure out, do I make it work on I, uh, an iPhone 5, uh, uh, iOS 6, 6.1, iOS 5? They're all, the, the matrix just becomes inordinately huge, very complicated to actually make for. Problem is even much worse on Android. So that's also compounding the problem. I've got to look at my notes here because I don't remember them all. One of the ways that you can help minimize this problem is to figure out how to platformize whatever it is you're making. If you look at people like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, what they figured out how to do is take the commonality of their app, make it uh, a nice little module, and they create the Chrome on for iOS or for Android. That's a lot less work than building it in a very bad way uh, and creating a single new executable across all these different devices. Not only is it a testing nightmare, but it's just a bad way to, to create one common set of functionality across all of these things. <coughs> That's all feeding into this one story, which is back to the device is dead. What way can you create a piece of, you know, a product, a technology, and have it work across all of them? Be careful that, uh, <laughs> how do you do that? Well, obviously with, with WebOS, I would say, uh, I'd say the answer is the web. Of course, being a web guy, I'm gonna say that. Uh, but if you're not building a WebOS app, uh, you know, both of those guys, I'm sure, would be happy to hear that. But if you're not building a WebOS app, how can you take advantage of web technology? Well, the LinkedIn guys actually did a pretty cool thing. What they did was figure out how to deploy their technology on the web. And the Chrome is a really lightweight thing which just embeds a web view. But they did that for Android and for iOS. But all the logic still lives in the cloud. I think that's pretty smart. <laughs> when you actually have uh, let's, let's go forward a little bit. You've got another year or two, I think, uh, before these other, you know, Scoble's a big fan of, of wearable computing and the context and all these other things. But, but really, at one point, to create products like that, we have to have an OS running on all these different devices. So at some point, your toilet and your phone and your everything else is going to be connected in some way, generating data, creating a compelling use of, 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 uh, of a broad ecosystem, you're not going to care at that point what OS your toilet's running. It's going to be running as an element of the cloud. The only way to really do that, again in my opinion, is to actually tie in with web technology. Marketability. This, is came, up, this came up earlier, in fact, in Scoble's talk. Uh, how do you make yourself visible in the App Store? And the first answer was know a guy. And, you know, that's hard to do. Uh, I know guys, and even that's hard to do. It's a lot of beer you've got to buy for people to, to get yourself noticed. If you don't have those connections, what do you do? Well, the next answer is you start to, to uh, get on this feature race. You've got this, uh, you know, somebody made, uh, you know, some stupid app that, that did, you know, one or two things. You do three, four, and five things. And now it's this race. Uh, to who can you differentiate, or how do you differentiate yourself by just adding more features? Guess what? That is the wrong thing to do. Absolutely the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do, uh, back in Apple, one of the things that was pounded into my head, which is why I'm bald, uh, is this practice of minimalism. Essentialism, I think, is actually the correct term. What that is, what's the bare minimum that you can create or do in your application that still makes it useful and makes people come back? It's sticky. That's what you're really trying to go for. Next big uh, uh, element of all this is we have to make it human. There's a uh, Ohm Malik, a Giga Ohm, did a really cool conference last fall sometime. And the focus of the conference was design, proper design. Uh, we've had and we've seen to date, uh, I think some fairly poor design across the board, across all the apps. Uh, not all of them, some people have done, I think, a pretty good job, but I don't think, uh, as developers, as companies, I don't think we've placed the proper emphasis on good design. Good design isn't just pretty pixels. 
Uh, it's a very orchestrated uh, user experience. From the moment you download it, what's your little screen look like, your splash screen? What's it look like when <clears throat> you go through the sign-on process? Do you really, really have to uh, use somebody's email address uh, through your sign-on flow? Uh, there are lots of ways that you can get around it, but think about it. I think a lot of people, especially engineers, we go for that easiest route. What's the best and fastest way uh, to, to get through something? <clears throat> when you look at design and how it impacts uh, a product, being small companies, we usually don't have, you know, a whole design element. Uh, we made it, you know, on our, our company of, of three, we actually hired one guy who does, no, I mean, rock star designer. It was that important to us that, that we actually create a well-designed, well-orchestrated, well-choreographed product uh, that we brought him on as a third founder. And I think <clears throat> while those people seem like unicorns, uh, they do exist. Uh, they actually are worth more than their weight in gold. And when they create products for you, design isn't just an afterthought or here's some sticky notes or here's a, you know, however you work. Design is a piece of the product that evolves over time. It should take just as much, if not more, work to design a good product than it is to write the code to actually create the product. <coughs> uh, brace design. I mean, that, that, you know, that's, that, that's the big message here. It, when we look at the future of mobile, I think uh, the future is uh, apps that run everywhere, that look and feel human, they're pretty, but they also perform something useful, which goes to uh, the next slide. Give yourself a way to go, a grow. Services, in general, I think are more profitable than apps. I hope we can agree on that, but it's okay if you don't. Uh, if you look at the top downloaded apps of all time on the Apple App Store, it's like Pandora, Facebook, Twitter, a few others. The one thing those all have in common is their app is an outlet of something much bigger, Uber. They've created or they figured out a way to platformize their app, make it run everywhere. It's exposing something much bigger and much stickier. Uh, and, and the app is more, of a, is more of a byproduct of the offering. So again, when I look forward to what's the future, I think it's services. I think services are going to be a huge, huge way to do this. Make it useful, focus on value. You know, there are some people that, for them, the end result is to waste time. Games or whatever. Other people, it's the opposite. You know, they want to save time. It's supposed to be something valuable. It's supposed to make my life more efficient. You have to pick your market, obviously address and design for that person. There was one other pe one other element I wanted to actually bring up here. You know, there's a huge burgeoning market uh, that's happening. And when you look at where the growth of mobile is going to happen, it's not in the United States. It's not Silicon Valley. It's not Silicon Alley. The growth is happening in what's called BRIC, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Every piece of data, back at HP with those 330,000 people generating data, one of the biggest pieces of data that, that pretty much the entire company left on was where is the most growth happening? It's happening in those areas. If we continue to make apps or products or services that are very centric to just us in this tiny little valley, we're not going to see that much growth. Right, the biggest growth is going to happen in all these other areas. Are they going to care about uh, you know, how the fastest way to order food uh, delivered to you? Uh, no, maybe not. I don't know. I just thought about it now. But maybe uh, can you see a lot of growth if you were to actually address a need in those areas? Probably. Uh, so what's the future of mobile? I think the future of mobile is getting off of this idea that there's one device and one platform to rule them all. If you take that approach, you're going to be commoditized. It's going to be just another app in the sea of App Store apps struggling to get noticed. You have to figure out how to address everything. It's a hard problem to solve. <clears throat> you want to build products for people. We can't get away with building apps that are really for other engineers. You know, the idea that you know, you'd actually get away with building Craigslist today, as useful as it is, almost seems kind of laughable. It's just it's ugly. Now that's part of its kitsch and you know, part of its appeal, but we can't do that today. I think users are now demanding a whole new slew of, of functionality and, and, and addressing, again, those big countries where they're not really used to using 
but they don't have you know, four years, five years, six years on, on mobile devices like we do. So we have to treat them like that. And then you want to create a service that allows people to keep coming back. You know, the idea that uh, anybody here could create you know, Camera Plus or Angry Birds or something like that, it's so, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's that. The way you're going to create value, at least statistically, you have a better uh, advantage for you, is to make a service. Uh, and it, I hope that's obvious, but if it's not, I'm, I'm certainly welcome the debate. Uh, uh, so uh, that's my brief little future of mobile. If you want other thoughts, I'm more than happy to talk to you about them. I think there's, um, I think there's a huge area of growth, uh, but again, aside from that kind of trinkety, uh, you know, consumerist in a list that we want to see, what's the next iPhone? What's the next Nexus going to do? What's the next tablet or wearable? You know, we can talk about that, but I think uh, the way we're going to be successful is to create uh, all of that. So uh, I'm going to open it up with questions right now. So please ask me. We got me time for and, one question, so real quick. And I'll be around afterwards, too. So if you want to tell me I'm full of shit, please. Andy, thanks for uh, a very grounding talk. Appreciate sure. it. Um, one question that occurs to me um, and also harmonizes something we heard earlier from Clayton Christensen. There's some similarities in some of your advice in terms of disruption and where things are evolving to. I didn't hear you mention the word architecture once in your dialogue. However, um, as an architect, it sounds to me like a lot of the advice that you're giving is along those lines. Can, can you comment on that? Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I, again, to me, I, no offense being an architect, but uh, it, to me it's such an overloaded word. Uh, an architect is kind of uh, the <laughs> fundamental, I mean, I, I wouldn't, the idea that somebody would actually create anything that isn't even architected, to me that's uh, I, I, laughably, horribly wrong. Uh, and I think I was thinking about that when, you know, when you look at how do you create a platform for your product, because that actually, you know, most companies, uh, it takes about five years for them to really figure out that the way they've built their products is wrong. And then they do these things called uh, erasing technical debt and all sorts of shit like that where they figure out, oh man, we didn't really architect our product properly from the beginning, so now we're gonna spend the next year or two. By the way, I've done this, so I like <laughs> uh, voice the experience. Uh, th that's a really, um, I would say it's the first, uh, what is that, uh, barrier to entry. I mean, it's not even something I'd even think about anymore. I, uh, now how do you get a, How do you get, you know, a kid uh, who, who has never worked commercially in their life before to, you know, to architect uh, uh, a proper solution? I don't know. I think uh, you hire other people that are experienced that can help that person. Uh, you know, the idea. Um, yeah, I'm not going to crap all over you too much. I, but you know, I think this is the idea that that there's standalone architects. Again, HP. We had architects come out of our ears. Uh, and, and honestly, it was, uh, it was a lot of guys that went to conferences and, uh, wait a minute, uh, <laughs> uh, that went to conferences and, and really kind of, uh, you know, here's the problem. One of the biggest problems we had with architects, standalone architects, uh, was that there was the perception that they didn't really do any work. Uh, they kind of sat in an ivory tower and dictated these grand, you know, uh, pictures and diagrams and they didn't have to do any of the actual implementation. That maybe is very different for you, but um, I've seen that really kind of go sideways, and it doesn't you know, generate a lot of goodwill with kind of the, the core engineers. That makes sense? I don't even know if I answered your question, but I can go on and on and on. Awesome, you guys give it up for Andy. All right, cheers. <laughs>